Welcome, my name is Cindy Wright and I am the Program Manager for the Child Neurology Foundation. Today's talk is part of an ongoing series on emerging issues that are facing families and children with neurologic conditions during COVID-19. These sessions bring together health professionals and families to have candid conversations and provide their expert advice to the child neurology community. Today, we're discussing management of disruptive and harmful behaviors with Shelley Meitzler and Dr. Nathan Call. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. To start off, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Shelley Meitzler. I am the Community Programs Manager East at the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance. I am also a parent with three children. Uh, two of my three children are living with tuberous sclerosis complex. So I have firsthand experience um, with some of the disruptful, harmful behaviors um, that we are currently experiencing as a family um, through COVID-19 and some of the challenges that we currently face. And I'm Nate Call. I'm the clinical director at the Marcus Autism Center <clears throat> and I'm an associate professor in the Emory University School of Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Call. We appreciate your time today. Um, so I wanted to just talk um, some of the issues around uh, the pandemic, loss of routine, um, few if any resources, fear and anxiety uh, about COVID-19 and how it could impact our families, reg uh, regression of skills previously mastered. So I'm sure you are hearing some of those similar challenges in your center. So how are your staff managing these situations with families? Yeah, so I think, you know, this is, it's almost become a cliche to say that these are unprecedented times, and that's really true. Um, and that means that uh, we've really had to rethink a lot of how we work with kids and families. One of the big things that we're doing that I think a lot of centers are doing right now is focusing on telehealth. Um, at our center, we've been doing telehealth for about five or six years, and so we had some practices already underway and some good ideas about how to work with kids and families, even if they are um, not able to come to our facility the way that they have in the past. Um, and so we're doing everything we can to continue to sustain the services that we were providing before, but more than anything, just reach out and stay in touch with our families. A big part of that is just check-in calls, for example, to just to see how some of them are doing and making sure that there aren't issues. Because one of the biggest things that we want to be careful about right now is keeping our kids and our families out of the emergency department, really, right? That's, that's kind of the worst place to be right now if you're not already sick, um, because that's where a lot of the, the illness is located. And so anything we can do to try to, to make that difference is something that we're, we're undertaking right now. Um, so when children start to regress or they have these new exaggerated behaviors, and of course, this is, I think, where a lot of families are seeing this, we're out of our routine, they're not seeing the familiar people that they're used to. So I sometimes find going back to the basics is important and essential um, to get through a day, but I realize that we have so many things running through our heads that sometimes we forget what some of those basic tools are. Um, so could you kind of refresh us and go through what some um, basic behavioral management tools families could be using right now? Yeah, so I think that you mentioned routines, which I think is a really important thing to try to establish. And, and obviously there's massive disruptions to, to the routines of the kids and families that we're seeing. And um, that can really create a lot of, of stress and anxiety. It can um, be a real challenge for some of the kids who are very fixated on some of their routines. Um, hopefully by now, you know, most of us have been living in this set of circumstances for a week or three and are, are at least kind of getting our groove in terms of what daily life looks like. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the case for all of the kids that we take care of. And so some things that can be helpful for establishing routines are things like consistency. Um, so at this point, I think in thinking about my own household and my own kids and how we kind of have a routine at this point where we, we do certain things at certain times and we follow that routine pretty lockstep day by day. Um, and then make sure that we're using, in, in some cases even, especially when starting a new routine, being able to be very, very consistent and use things like the same terms each time. So, you know, if we're going to add something to the kid's routine, if we're going to do um, uh, like a, a, a 
video school or something like that. We call it school, even though it may be in the same thing every time. We don't call it, well, now it's time to do school and now it's time to do a chat with the teacher and now it's time to do, like Tuesday it's a different name and Wednesday it's a different name, Thursday it's something else altogether. Calling it the same thing every time so that the child is learning, all right, when you say this, this is what that means. That can be really key. And even adding things like visual cues and prompts could be really effective as well. So, um, you know, having something like a picture schedule for kids for whom that's a better tool, or at least a, than, a, than a textual schedule, text based schedule that shows an icon or a picture of here's what we're doing first. And it's kind of this, then that, then the next thing, so that it's really clear how we work our way through our day. Um, that can all those things can all be really important. In terms of just kind of general principles, um, when it comes to challenging behavior, these are behaviors that are likely to be cropping up. And um, you know, more than anything else, I think the, the point I try to make every opportunity I get is to try to take a functional approach to how we deal with challenging behaviors. And that really means understanding what the purpose of the behavior is from the child's perspective. So why is this child doing this? It's not always just because they're upset or they're trying to get a rise out of someone or reaction that can be it sometimes, but understanding what is the purpose of the behavior from the child standpoint, especially for those kids who lack some of the communication skills that might otherwise be an effective way to get the people around them to behave in the way that they want. Um, understanding what the message is behind the behavior and then understanding how do we um, either make sure that there's no payoff for problem behavior, but that there is payoff for the appropriate behaviors. So when you're seeing that appropriate response instead, that we're going ahead and reinforcing that. And that sometimes means taking a step back. We do expect to see some regression. And so taking a step back in terms of what expectations we have for some of our kids, so that we are not expecting them to live up to the same standards that maybe they were achieving when they were in school and everything was the way that they were used to, that, that we may not necessarily require the same amount of of homework from them as they were doing before, or the same performance on chores or other tasks or hygiene or, or self-care skills that for right now, the, the point is to kind of get through the day for as long as we can. It's important to make sure that we're making the best of the time we have, but, but these kids are in a very disrupted environment and that's all kids at this environment. I know that as a parent, I feel that way. So my kids absolutely are feeling that way. Um, so being comfortable with taking a little bit of a step back so that we can get things under good control. And then once we feel like you're in a good routine, once you feel as though things are kind of recentered, that's the time to maybe start pushing the envelope a little bit more. But at least at first, giving, giving the kid and the family and everyone involved a little bit of latitude to, to take a step back. Thank you. I think that's definitely reassuring to hear. Um, as a parent, I certainly have kind of reevaluated as you talked about the priorities. And, and I think really accepting and having that conversation, regression is bound to happen. And it's okay that we accept that at this point, because it is really getting through the day to the best that we can um, and, and, and giving it our best effort, but knowing that we're all going through some form of regression. Um, so what do you advise for parents? Um, you know, we have these, you know, some people have the telehealth and have the access to professionals, um, but there, there still are people, you know, single caregivers, parents um, that don't have anyone. Um, so what do you do when you don't have the support of the team you usually have? Wait, they may not have technology access to that. And really, what are the priorities then for someone kind of solo with a child with these behaviors? So again, I think the first thing is to really think about, I think the last point you made is important, which is last part of your question is important, which is what are the priorities, right? And in this unusual set of circumstances, priority number one has to be health and safety, right? Um, and that means that we might have to set aside some things. I keep saying we, cause I got kids and I'm dealing with this like everyone else. But that means that there may be a need for a little while to set aside some of the, the um, targets and goals that we're being focused on, like some academic skills, for example. Um, not every kid is at a place where they're gonna be able to make a ton of progress on those right now. And that's okay. I know, I, I mean, frankly, I've regressed in some things, right? Like some of my daily routines are disrupted too, and I'm not as up to speed on certain things. I only shave once a week at this point, right? So <laughs> all of us are regressing in our own ways um, or taking a step back and reprioritizing what's most important. And so I think certain, certain um, activities that were maybe more important before may not be now because the focus needs to be on getting through this period of time and so that we can come out at stronger on the back end and get back into those, those uh, other activities and be able to take advantage of the types of supports and therapists and so forth to help us um, move forward a little bit more. 
Um, beyond that, I think that there are things that can be accomplished at home um, by a caregiver. And there are some good toolkits that exist out there that folks could use to try to work on specific skills. But the number one thing that I would say is that those parents who find themselves in the new circumstances of being a, a doing homeschool when they never planned on doing homeschool, um, the first thing would be to do what you alluded to in the last part of your question, which is first prioritize. Identify a handful of things. If you if you have it in you and you have the, the bandwidth and the ability to do a little bit of, of that programming for you and your, your family, first prioritize what it is that you want to work on and come up with a manageable list of a couple of things, right? Don't try to do everything, right? It's really hard to boil the ocean. You do a little bit at first. And so starting with just the small couple of tasks that you want to work on, a couple of skills you want to work on, that's great. Measure your progress so you know when you're making success, uh, when you're making progress. And you can also note if you're not how to make a change. But a lot of toolkits and other um, resources are out there for families who have a little bit of capacity um, to try to do some work, but, but be, make sure you're doing it in manageable size chunks. That makes sense. I, I think it's fair. And I think we all have all of a sudden become these multiple roles of caregivers, parents, if you're uh, working from home and navigating that. Um, and of course, now these potential online curriculums. And for some of our, our kids with these more challenging behaviors, um, it's not as easy to just sit down in front of a computer or a tablet and, and start that back and forth learning. So certainly appreciate um, Kind of prioritizing um, and, and again I think reminding ourselves that we are doing the best we can um, and that's all that we can ask and expect of ourselves and of our kiddos, our loved ones. So thank you for that. Um, so there are still some therapies that of course children can get in a virtual way. Can parents utilize uh, the providers for virtual parent consultations and still have that covered through insurances or schools right now? So there's been a lot of um, relaxation of some of the regulations and uh, policies around things like telehealth, um, both at the federal and most states have done, the federal, federal level and most states as well. Things like um, in the past, there have been a lot of regulations around which software can be used to provide telehealth. Um, and there's been some relaxation even to allowing things like FaceTime or Zoom in some states to do some of this. Um, there's also been relaxation in terms of a lot of the payers. And so at least in our state, Medicaid has come out and said that um, not just clinic to home telehealth, but also home to home. So a provider can be in their home and not have to come to a site, um, can all be reimbursed. Um, commercial payers, it's a little bit more hit and miss. Um, school systems, it's, it's again, it's a little bit based on what your school system's capacity is for that type of a thing. But there's absolutely um, lots of opportunities. It's the kind of thing to be asking about. If you're not being approached, then to ask your providers, are, there, are, are, you, are you doing this? And if not, do you know of colleagues who are um, so that you can access those types of services uh, as well? Perfect. Um, so for a lot of children, we, you know, they recognize that they are out of a routine and, and you kind of touched on this a little bit. There are some that um, there may be intellectual disabilities, language delays. And so we can't, we can't explain to them um, some of the things that may have been in a routine or even things that they worked for reinforcers. They don't understand that we can't go to the store. We can't go to the park. Um, and we know that as um, their anxiety increases when ours is increased as well. So can you give us um, any, any tips to kind of help not only the caregivers decrease their anxiety so that we can better soothe and reassure our loved ones, again, when we can't have just a, an open dialect and, and kind of explain what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're, there's kind of two parts to your question. One is how do we as those who are caring for kids um, make sure that we're staying um, centered and able to and, and calm and that our anxiety doesn't then pass along to our loved ones. And then the other part is more about how do we find things and, and make sure that we're giving um, able to provide preferred items and activities to, to a child. And so for the first part, again, I think that the biggest thing is to have a, a, a network of people if you possibly can. All of us are feeling really isolated right now. Um, and so, you know, social, whether it's, you know, there's been a lot of questions about social media and whether it's good or bad, but if that's how you connect with other people, I think that that's a, this is a good time to make sure you're forging those connections and maintaining those connections. If it's you know, um, family through FaceTime or other um, video conferencing opportunities, those types of things, so that we're 
we at least have that outlet to kind of let other people know how we're feeling because all of us are in our own set of struggles. Um, so seeking help where you, when you need it is really important. Feeling connected to others so that you're not isolated, uh, I think is that self-care is really important. And I've heard lots of interesting stories about people picking up new strange hobbies and being able to, to just to spend the time in some way that they feel like they have control over the world. Because right now we all feel a little bit out of control. None of us ever thought we would be living through something like this and that loss of control can be really unsettling. So right. finding something that you can control, I think is useful as a caregiver to have. And then with respect to our kids and the kids that we care for, um, you know, this is again a time that where we might have to try new things and things that maybe were off the table before might be a little more acceptable now, right? My, my youngest son has had way more screen time right. than I ever thought I would ever be okay with. But, but in this situation where I'm working, my wife is working remotely, um, you know, and, and not, there's not a lot of other opportunities for him to socialize with other kids. You know what, at the end of the day, is it the worst thing in the world? probably not relative to what else could be going on. And so I'm a, I've relaxed a lot of my prior expectations about what is and is not acceptable so that we can just get through this next couple of weeks or months. Perfect. Yes. It's, um, it's certainly been an interesting mix of you do. I've looked and reassessed and made those lists and priorities um, and certainly have deemed that screen time is highly preferred. So I'm kind of saving that as one of my last tricks in the bag because yeah. Um, we, I'm in a state that we have just confirmed, you know, we're closing our school for the rest of the year. So I, I'm ready to kind of use those things. So for, for parents, caregivers, we know that we're probably in this, you know, at a minimum for another month. And, and we touched upon this. Many are doing it alone. And I'm a huge proponent for self-care. I, you know, have really made that a focus. I know that I have to be well to provide the care that all of my family needs, you know, whether special needs or not. So some of the challenges for people, um, I'm fortunate I have a spouse and so I can take some of that time at the end of the night, but my heart goes out to families that only have one person there. You know, you don't get someone tagging in at the end of the day to help you. So are there suggestions in terms of if they're linking up with social media and things like that, how can you still get even a couple minutes of self-care if you are the primary caregiver and, and you can't leave your loved one unattended for an extended period of time. So are there activities or things that we could kind of give them to keep them safe, but still take a breather ourselves? Yeah, I mean, a big part of that is being able to, to monitor the child and stay safe, right? So that's one of the things that we um, sometimes think about in our, in our clinic and our services is that, you know, you can't necessarily leave that child alone but you do need to just step away for a minute. And so even things like, um, you know, access to, to cameras or, or other technology that allows you to monitor the child so that you know that the child's okay, you know what they're up to, but you don't necessarily have to be right there all the time. And again, not everybody has access to that. And certainly I've heard that delivery times are delayed and it's hard to get new technology at this time. Um, but sometimes there's pretty simple ways to to rig something. So if you, you, know, you have two phones, you FaceTime yourself, you put one in the room and you go in the other. And that way you can just you know, take a bath and sit and soak in the tub for a minute and know that you can see what's going on in the other room. Um, things like that, I think, uh, can go a long way towards giving families a little bit of um, opportunity to feel both safe, but also to, to unplug for just a minute or two. Okay, thank you. Um, so what do you recommend for a child or parent um, if they test positive for COVID-19 and they need to be quarantined? And so this, I think, you know, it's similar, you know, there's this recurring theme of, so for someone that doesn't have access to anyone else in the home, how can you safely keep you and your child distanced enough, but maintain their safety and all of those concerns that, that really are a challenge on a daily basis without something like this? Yeah, I mean, so working in a big children's hospital, we've been confronted with a couple of these types of challenging situations, and they're tough, I'll be honest with you. Um, we've had a couple of kids who've been COVID positive and on the autism spectrum or have a, a developmental disability who've been in the hospital. One child who has a history of eloping, and you can imagine we had a kid who was running out of the isolation room that he's supposed to be in in the hospital and going into other parts of the hospital where he's COVID positive, he's exposing other people potentially, huge problems, right? And so we've had to really think about creative problem solving in each one of these cases. And they are a little bit case by case. Um, one piece of advice I can give is just around things like, if you do find yourself having to go into the hospital to get tested or in order to care for a child, 
Um, they're the kinds of things, I think being ready for that in advance is really important. Have a go bag, right? With they set aside with all of the stuff so that if you have to go to the hospital or to the ED, you're ready to go and you can stay safe. Knowing to ask for certain things, a lot of hospitals right now have sensory friendly waiting areas. And so asking for those so that your child can be both a little bit isolated from an infection control standpoint, but also just from the standpoint of being able to not be around all of the other kids and all the noise or other distractors or things that might be aversive. Um, asking for child life as early as possible. Um, there, there are a lot of hospitals who have folks who specialize in making time in the hospital more accommodating to kids and kids in general, but kids with disabilities in particular. And so they will oftentimes have a different kind of access to things like iPads and preferred items and be able to tailor your child's uh, environment and experience a little bit more to what they need than what might be the norm for most kids who come through those types of settings. So I think, you know, really thinking through that piece of it and being ready for if it comes to that, how are we going to handle that, um, I think is one important thing. When it comes to being quarantined in your own home, you know, I think those are the kinds of issues that just tough decisions are going to have to get made in some cases. And it's, I don't envy anybody to have to make a choice between, you know, my child's positive, what does that mean for me from an exposure standpoint? I think talk to your doctor and be really clear about, you know, are, is, are the odds good that you're already exposed and therefore you can stay with them? Just really getting a good sense. And I'm not that medical professional who can give that kind of advice. Um, but it's, I mean, there just really are some um, unbelievable circumstances that are coming up for a lot of our families that they're going through. Um, it just gives me all the more respect than I already had for a lot of them. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think it's important too, and, and we, you know, be that, that being prepared, right? We are in this uncontrollable situation, but there are still certain things that we can control. Um, I've, I've been, I've had a lot of direct contact with my daughter's team. You know, we, we have plans in place and things really to outline and obviously looking at what works best for us. And, and I think along those lines then for families, you know, do you, are you currently working with families where the risk benefit of having um, behavioral supports in their home, and they've made that decision because that's what worked individually for their families and that need is greater? Have you? I mean, we have for sure. Um, and they, they tend to be, so right now, at least for our center, we're having to make that on a case-by-case -case basis. And in, and in large part, what we're trying to do is approach this from the standpoint of how do we keep kids out of things like the hospital? How are we going to keep kids out of the emergency department? Um, right. Because again, these are the place where really we don't want kids to end up. And so, um, we've had to really prioritize those types of kids where we feel like their behavior is, has a high probability of them um, requiring that kind of, um, you know, ex having to go through that. And that is not good from an infection control standpoint or a quality of life standpoint or, and even an infection control standpoint for not just for the kid, but for the parents and for the providers. So we have had to make that call a few times. And it really is a case by case decision that has to get made based on knowing, um, the probabilities around how this child's behavior may impact them and their family and, and those around them. Thank you. Um, so we do have those situations, as you talked about, where there are going to be children that will still have a crisis and escalate in these types of situations. It doesn't take a day off. So for families, um, if their child becomes a threat to themselves or, or others, who should they call? What, what should they kind of be the protocol of those next steps to reach out for assistance? So ultimately, one can always call emergency responders. I mean, that they are still on the front lines and they are still there to respond. I think um, it is something that many people are very hesitant to do with good reason, uh, because um, I think a lot of us have heard stories or in some cases just outright experienced first responders who um, don't necessarily understand um, folks with developmental disabilities, um, folks who or kids who maybe react differently um, to something like a stranger approaching them. And so that's something that many families are really hesitant to do with good cause. Um, and so that's one of those things that um, is kind of the last line for a lot of folks. Um, beyond that, different states tend to differ. And so, you know, in Georgia, where I live, for example, there's a crisis line that people can call and get someone from the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities to do a crisis assessment and see if there are services or if they can provide um, a, a response that's not going to be as timely as someone like a first responder, but that can still be accessible, hopefully, within 24 hours. Um, and so it really varies state by state. Um, but at the end of the day, if someone's really at risk of harm, um, 
those first responders really are the, the last line of defense and they they're and so if you do end up finding yourself that you're in a situation where you have to make that call trying to provide as much information up front is really is really key so that folks know what they're walking into um, and if there's a way to help them understand um, how to best respond to your child and how to best approach them and help de-escalate um, that really is key it's a little tough at this time but there are some good programs that are out there for training first responders and if you are in a community where um, they're open to that kind of thing i think being able to provide that type of training to first responders so they know a little bit more about how to work with individuals with developmental disabilities um, you know this may not be the time for that um, in hindsight, of course, 2020, we all wish we would have done something like that a long time ago, um, but it's something to definitely consider going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's definitely, there's some learning opportunities even in the future. We certainly never really expected to be in a situation like this, but I do think we can always learn something from it and it can certainly add additional tools to our tool bags and, and prepare us, uh, you know, unfortunately, if this were ever to become something that we're faced with again. Um, thank you. You know, as, as a parent, first and foremost, you know, there are days where, you know, we, we just want to get through the day and, you know, we want to do what's best for our families, but we have safety is first um, and, you know, keeping them safe is obviously, um, and I think, you know, just reminding us it's okay um, that there's going to be regression, that we're going to do the best we can. Um, we're all in this together and, and we will get through it. So thank you. Is there any other advice or anything else that I didn't touch upon that you think would be beneficial to share? I mean, not so much advice. It's the, the, the last thing you said, which is it's hard to feel like we're all in this together when folks are feeling as isolated as they might feel right now. But just remembering that there are other folks who are dealing with this. And, and even in the best of times, it can sometimes feel like you know, you're the only person who's going through this. You're the only person who's, re and, and as someone who works with lots of families who feel like they're the only ones going through this, I can say that you're not. Um, and so that's where I think groups like this who are able to bring families together who are all going through the same sets of challenges. Of course, every, the specifics are unique, but the overall experience can oftentimes be pretty similar. And so I'm so grateful for organizations like yours that can bring families together so that they don't feel isolated and they don't feel like they're the only ones. And so that's why I'm so proud to have an opportunity to work with you guys to, to help families hopefully feel a little less alone in this time when we all feel a little bit alone. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. We are so grateful for your time and dedication as well. I, this has been extremely helpful and I know families will use this as a resource, something to go back to, to reassure themselves, to calm themselves and say, I, I can get through this. I'm not alone. So thank you so much for your time. We're so grateful for you. Thank you. Shelly and Nate, thank you so much for taking the time to discuss disruptive and harmful behaviors with us. Your expertise is truly helpful to the child neurology community. And for our viewers, if you need additional resources or would like to see other Child Neurology Foundation original content, we encourage you to visit our COVID-19 resource page at www.childneurologyfoundation.org slash COVID-19. Together, we will get through this, and together, we are all child neurology. Thank you. <laughs>